Okay, I think we can start now. Um, we're a little bit over, um, but I think we've got most of our uh, sign-up audience in. So let me first of all welcome everyone to the Middle East 101 series, which is one of the Institute's flagship events. Um, if you have been here from the beginning, then you know that this is the third in a series of 12 sessions. And in the first few sessions, we have been looking at essentially the um, geopolitics of the Middle East region. Last week, we, our speaker, Professor Abdullah Babu, talked about the Gulf, um, the, um, the dynamic of the Gulf, its impact on the broader region, um, and the impact of its relationship with other countries within the um, sort of greater Middle East region. Today, we will look at Turkey, Iran, and Russia. Um, now, Russia is not a Middle Eastern country, but it has an old and long history with the Middle East. And I think when you talk about Turkey and Iran, who are not Arab states, but they are definitely part of the greater Middle East region. Um, and, you know, these are, and they're also very old neighbors. They have long imperial histories. I mean, uh, you know, if you look at Russia, you will know that it has a long and old history. Iran was the Persian Empire. Turkey was the Ottoman Empire. You know, so it's in their DNA. There's a long sense of their history. Um, in the 21st century, what we see are three polities with expansionist agendas. You know, um, I think since you see the proliferation of transnational networks since the 1990s and the unraveling of the Middle East since the Iraq war, there have been spaces that have been created to allow these countries to actually um, uh, move ahead with their own expansionist agendas and ambitions, right? Um, and they've become in many ways major players in the Middle East and in North Africa. Um, and they are both partners and foes. And those relationships shift based according to what their interests are, whether they have shared interests or they have opposing interests. Right? So in today's lecture, we've got two of our MEI fellows, uh, Dr. Sarkhan Yolakan and Dr. Asif Shuja, uh, who will actually analyze the visions and the capabilities of these three countries, particularly Turkey and Iran, and what they will explore in the course of their presentations, and each of them will speak for about 20 minutes, is their friction-ridden cooperation with Russia and their political reach into Asia via Qatar, Pakistan, and Malaysia. Right. Let me talk a little bit about our two speakers. Um, Sir Khan is, uh, we are very sad to lose him. He's actually, uh, he's actually taken up a, a new position um, uh, in the US. Uh, but since he's here for a few more days, we have been opportunistic and grabbed him to, to actually come and speak uh, at today's session. Um, he, is, uh, he is Turkish himself. He currently, his areas of interest are mercantile and religious networks, such as the channels of informal, informal diplomacy across Asia. He holds a PhD in cultural anthropology from Duke University and an MA in Sociology and Social Anthropology from the Central European University. Asif uh, is originally from India, but he is an Iran expert. Um, when we first met him, we discovered there were many interesting facets to Asif. He, he speaks Persian. He, he reads uh, Persian poetry, loves all the, the ancient Persian poets of antiquity. Um, his research focus includes Iranian domestic politics, the Iranian nuclear issue, Iran's foreign policy, and Iran's regional role. Previously, he was associated with the International Center for Strategic Studies in Abu Dhabi as a non-resident fellow. He's also had research affiliations with the Indian Council of World Affairs and the Center for Air Power Studies in New Delhi. Asif obtained his PhD from the Center for West Asian Studies at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. Um, and both of them are authors of various books. Um, you know, I won't go into too much of that because I would really like to give the floor to them. Um, 
we will start first with, uh, are we starting first with you, Sir Khan, or with, with Asif, with you first? So we will start with Sir Khan, who will speak for about 20 minutes, and then Asif will speak for about 20 minutes. We'll then open the floor to question and answers. Right now, you are all muted, um, and we ask you all to keep your cameras off. Uh, but later on, during the questions and answers, when we unmute you, uh, you can either choose to raise your hand to ask a question directly, and we will then unmute you, uh, or you can use the chat if you prefer. Uh, but I think actually both our speakers would rather that you raise your hand and you ask, you directed the question at them uh, and ask them directly so that they can answer you directly. Right. So Sirkan, let me give you the floor now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you all for joining us in this session. Uh, in the 20 minutes I have, I'll try to give you a broad overview of um, Turkey's re-emergence in the 21st century as um, a state with an expansionist outlook, as, as Michelle already indicated. And to be clear, just right at the outset, by expansionism, I don't mean things like territorial annexation or colonial intervention. I simply refer to political agendas to build cultural and economic influence beyond the sovereign territories. And also having a sense of moral obligation or a sort of historical entitlement to be involved in the affairs of other countries. Today we're very used to hearing about Turkish involvement in various military conflicts, energy rivalries, peace processes, port building, military training, humanitarian aid, what have you. What is also striking is the geographical scale of these uh, operations, which extends from North Africa all the way to Southeast Asia, and um, lately from the news, maybe you are aware, involves the contested waters of uh, the Eastern Mediterranean as well. And although we are used to this image of Turkey as a state with bold moves, this was rather unthinkable some three decades ago. Actually, during the Cold War, Turkey was an inward looking state with very little ambition beyond its national borders. So what explains its transformation into an outward looking state with a newfound confidence? Or in other words, what transformed Turkey from, um, let's say a shy introvert boy, as it were, into a boastful big boy of the neighborhood? Is it all about the vision of one man? Is it all about the one man rule of Erdogan? Now, of course, Erdogan certainly has an outsized role in, in, in defining Turkey's political outlook today. But to understand the roots of his vision, his, his confidence, and, and the tools that he deploys, I think we need to rewind the story a little. And that's what I will do um, today. I basically identify two historical turning points um, that I think laid the groundwork for an expansionist Turkey. I argued this in uh, my earlier lectures at MEI, also in some of my writings, and I think it's worth repeating. One of these um, historical um, turning points is the economic liberalization of the country in 1980. And the other is the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, which obviously ended the Cold War. Let me talk about the first one a little bit. Um, the economic liberalization was important because it enabled small enterprises in provincial towns of Turkey to participate in the export economy, which, which allowed them to accumulate significant wealth and build capacity, especially in sectors like manufacturing and construction. And this had two very significant consequences. The first, these provincial entrepreneurs who came from conservative Muslim background threatened the monopoly of big businesses in Istanbul that had been protected by state subsidies until that point. And second, and more importantly, because these Muslim entrepreneurs grew rich without any protection from the state, they did not feel any obligation to uphold the official ideological line of the state which was at the time staunchly secularist and wary of any deviation from the nation state logic. 
So as a new social force gathering momentum, um, these Muslim entrepreneurs, by the way, they are known as the Anatolian Tigers, named after um, the Tigers of Southeast Asia. Uh, they formed their own solidarity networks. And this was important because not only did their solidarity networks, whether they're association, charity networks, business, um, voluntary or business associations, um, not only did that enable further economic cooperation among themselves, but they also created channels, alternative channels for the dissemination of ideas that had remained in the periphery of cultural and intellectual production uh, in the country. And obviously these ideas were critical of state policies, uh, which was staunchly secularist, as I said, uh, which were against the public expressions of piety, for example, or the use of religious symbols in the public space. Um, so these ideas being critical of state advocated a new um, social contract that would ideally respect the sentiments and aspirations of, of the Muslim majority. These critiques from the periphery, most importantly, targeted the inward looking, uh, inward looking logic of the state as well, and sought to reconnect with the imperial past of the country and revive it. So thanks to, these, to the circulation of these new aspirations and ideas, um, in this period, we saw the rise of a new right-wing ideology known as the Turkish Islamic synthesis, which holds that one, Islam is indispensable to Turkish identity. Second, Turks have a privileged role in the spread of the religion. They have a historical mission, if you like. So with this new ideological mission and growing wealth in their hands, the Muslim networks showed great interest in the fate of Muslims living elsewhere, especially those uh, living under imperial, um, colonial or oppressive regimes. In one place, um, they watched very closely, and that was the Soviet Union, where millions of Turkic-speaking nominal Muslims lived. So when the communist bloc collapsed uh, in 1991, Turkish tigers found themselves in the perfect position. They had a decade-long experience with free market economy and had a renewed religious mission and so they were ready to bring the former communists into the fold of Islam on the one hand and global capitalism on the other, but both at the same time. So business and religion went hand in hand as these Turkish Muslim networks began to flex their muscles beyond uh, the national borders of Turkey, particularly in places like the Caucasus, Central Asia, the Balkans, and so on. And these experiences propelled them into a transnational force, a force that married Turkey's economic transformation, its liberalization, to the post-Cold War dynamism of its neighborhood, a neighborhood including a very large geography actually extending from um, post-communist Asia all the way to Eastern Europe. So by the time Erdogan came to power in 2003, these networks had a decade long experience in doing business, delivering humanitarian aid, establishing educational ties in all these places and had already extended their operations uh, beyond the uh, former communist space into uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, South Asia and Southeast Asia and to the Americas even. So all Erdogan had to do was to follow in their footsteps. And basically that is what he did. Uh, under Erdogan's rule, Turkish state, um, I think it was 2007, 2008, opened embassies in countries where these Muslim communities were um, active. And Turkish Airlines added these places to its uh, network of destinations, which created an unprecedented traffic between Turkey and the rest of the world. So uh, money, um, resources, ideas, uh, people, flew in both directions. So it was thanks to these Muslim networks that Erdogan could win major points, both uh, domestically and in foreign affairs. At, at home, he 
became the political voice of these provincial networks that I described. And by doing so, he could present himself as, as a democratic reformer. Uh, this may sound uh, like, they, this may sound a bit uh, unimaginable today, uh, Erdogan as a democratic reformer, but that was his image a decade ago. Uh, he, he fashioned himself in that, that way by bringing the Muslim majority in the periphery to the political center and opening uh, Turkey up in that way. And by following these networks out, he also benefited from their resources uh, outside of the country to build a new international profile for Turkey, which was now outward looking, assertive, uh, defending its interests uh, in the neighborhood and beyond. Which if you look at uh, Turkey's uh, involvement in various crises or uh, um, reconciliation processes, um, etc., are, are a legacy of, of this uh, momentum. But why did I tell you this story? I, I, I'm telling you this story in part to emphasize uh, the role of networks in transforming states. And uh, that is particularly critical in understanding um, why Erdogan is, is so confident, why his, his vision is very expensive, uh, sometimes uh, too bold in, in a way that doesn't really match uh, the resources Turkey has. Um, and I wanted to give you a sense of the social and the ideological basis of Erdogan's geopolitical assertiveness um, today. And it is important because without this sort of network-based perspective, um, we make the mistake of uh, seeing imperial symbols, historical and religious narratives, and things like that as sort of cheap moves or even tools of deception employed by the strongmen. And in fact, they are the very language of communication between the leader and the networks. And also the state's engagement with other um, states and societies. So in a way, history, history and religion remain very close to surface in Turkey's geopolitical vision and engagements. It's not subsidiary, it's not incidental um, to the decisions that Turkey makes or the tools that it deploys uh, in, 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 its, mm, in its foreign policy. So I'll give you one example. Uh, during Erdogan's visit to um, the Pakistani parliament, he gave a rousing uh, address. Uh, it was earlier this year. And in that speech, Erdogan invoked um, the Muslim empires of uh, Mughals and Ghaznavids to basically emphasize the shared inheritance of Turkic and South Asian Muslims in, in the subcontinent. And in, in doing so, basically, he was offering an alternative historical imagination in which Pakistanis figured not as the victims of European colonization, but as the Turks' partners in Muslim empire building in pre-colonial times. So basically he was jumping over the colonial times and reviving a historical period to resituate Pakistanis as Turks and, and, and Turks as, as partners in uh, empire building. And during the same speech, Erdogan recalled a massive rally in Lahore uh, at the beginning of the 20th century in support of the Ottoman Empire during the Battle of Gallipoli which is a founding episode for Turkish nationalists and Islamists. And he, end, he ended uh, the, these historical ex excursions with a powerful moral message to both the Pakistani parliamentarians uh, who were listening, but also to millions of Pakistanis who watched the event live on TV. He said, and I quote, Kashmir today is what Gallipoli was in the past. So the, the implications uh, were very clear. On the receiving end, uh, Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan uh, did also his part in injecting history into the bilateral relations by basically promoting the Turkish television series Resurrection, uh, which is a, a Muslim version of Game of Thrones, I guess, uh, which, was set, which is set in the 13th century Anatolia in which Turkish Muslim heroes are waging a religious war against the Byzantines. 
the show has become a massive phenomenon in Pakistan where it is constantly trending on social media. Um, so Turkey's long imperial history and the presence of actors who are willing to engage with that imperial history or willing to revive it in some ways gives the state a certain capability to work with networks, to communicate with networks and mobilize religious and imperial symbols across far-flung uh, places. And this is what sets it apart, in my opinion, from its neighbors to the south, um, particularly Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and, and Egypt, which are quite wary of, of Muslim networks uh, in the past decade and, and le much less enamored by imperial glory or histories. But they too recognize the soft power of history, especially when it is deployed through cultural production. So to counter Turkey's neo-Ottoman uh, bid for soft power, if you like, through historical dramas, Saudi Arabia and UAE also co-financed a competing production uh, called Kingdoms of Fire. I think, I guess it's available on Netflix. The Turkish show is also available on Netflix as far as I remember. Uh, so you can watch them both and make the comparison and draw conclusions for your own. Um, so this, this, this uh, show uh, co-financed by UAE and, and the Saudis, Kingdoms of Fire, um, basically portrays the Ottoman Empire not as the zenith of Muslim unity, but as a dark time for the Arabs. Um, it basically depicts a rivalry between the Ottoman Sultan and the Mamluk Sultan of Egypt in the early 16th century, uh, Ottomans and coming and uh, conquering Egypt is what, what the show is focusing on. So this difference um, between Turkey and maybe countries like Turkey, and we can include probably Iran and, and Russia in that category as well as, as uh, Michelle pointed out in the introduction that these are uh, old neighbors with long uh, imperial histories. The difference between them and, and uh, perhaps relatively new countries uh, to the South um, and the difference being a, a Muslim sensibility, um, maybe a, his, a historical, a historically constructed Muslim sensibility on the one hand, and the presence of networks who are uh, willing to work with that sensibility and disseminate it, uh, agitate it, so on and so forth. When we combine that with the ongoing Iran Gulf rivalry, all this has grown into a broader geopolitical realignment in the region in the last couple of years. And strangely enough, this alignment came into clear view in Kuala Lumpur summit uh, last year in 2019, which brought together um, the Emir of Qatar on the one hand, uh, Iranian president Hassan Rouhani and, and Erdogan. Another expected participant was Pakistan's Imran Khan, but he withdrew from the meeting last minute due to the alleged pressure from Saudi Arabia, which is the traditional gatekeeper of the uh, OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Also missing from the table uh, were the leaders of the United, the UAE, Egypt, uh, whose conspicuous absence pointed to another uh, competing axis. It was very clear. So the, country, the countries in this, in this axis, the computing axis, have been causing up to Israel, uh, as you may be uh, aware uh, from the recent uh, news, the, the reestablishment of diplomatic relations with the, uh, between the UAE and Israel is one example. And um, they also share a strong aversion to political Islam, which is a sharp contrast to the first grouping. And this first grouping, involves Turkey, Iran, Qatar, after the uh, falling out between Qatar and the other GCC countries, um, Pakistan to a certain extent, and even Malaysia. And at first glance, Turkey and Malaysia seem too far apart geographically uh, to form a rival uh, sort of Muslim axis across uh, Eurasia. Um, but even on that front, there have been a lot of uh, interesting developments. I won't go into the details, but uh, I just want to bring up the historical dimension again uh, one last time. 
because scholars in both countries are already hard at work um, trying to promote an understanding of the present Turkish-Malaysian exchanges as part of long-lasting historical ties and religious affinities. Um, the following a memorandum between uh, the Islamic University in Malaysia and the Turkish government in 2014, uh, two partner centers opened uh, in Malaysia and Turkey. Uh, one is the Center for Malay World and the Ottoman Studies at the Islamic University in Kuala Lumpur. And the other is the Center for the Ottoman Malay World Studies at uh, Fatih Sultan Mehmet University in Istanbul. Um, and in the short run, there's no uh, real outcome from these, uh, these exchanges, but I think they will have a long-term impact. And I want to uh, end with this, and I want to leave the discussion on Russia to the Q&A, at least on my part, uh, partly not to take uh, up more time. Um, and I want to end and with the idea that, that long imperial histories give countries like Turkey, um, and I include in that category Iran and Russia, a language, uh, a language that is, in my opinion, largely absent in the Arab world, whereby these countries can mobilize networks and discourses and build partnerships as far away, you know, far flung places like the Balkans and Malaysia and Sub-Saharan Africa, and to lure states and societies to their side in their geopolitical competition. So I'm gonna end here. Uh, I wanted to give you sort of the broader um, dynamics and the capabilities of, of Turkish expansionism, um, but I'm willing to pick up uh, any details and discuss them uh, in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Khan. That's very interesting. Um, I think for me, a key takeaway is this whole notion of the networks. And the second is the sense of history. I think in, in that part of the world, in the Middle East and the Greater Middle East, you can't look at these countries um, especially some of the non-Arab states, without being aware of their history. You know? And the Ottomans do have a history with what is, with, with the Arab, with these various Arab countries, you know, it goes back into antiquity. Um, and neither side has forgotten, you know. And these carry forward into the 21st century. So, you know, let's hold that thought. And let's now hear from Asif. Um, as he talks us through Iran, another ancient civilization, um, um, with its own ideas of um, the space that it wants to create for itself and uh, the role that it seeks to play within that part of the world. Asif, you have the floor. Thank you, Sir Khan. Thank you, uh, Michel. Uh, thank you, Sir Khan, for that eloquent uh, uh, narration on, on Turkey. And uh, I hope I, I'm audible, right? Uh, uh, can can everybody hear me? Uh, okay, so uh, uh, just to start, uh, 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 I'll just give one example, and that is uh, uh, just to put the three powers into perspective. Uh, that is Iran, uh, Russia, and Turkey. Uh, the example of uh, S three hundred and S four hundred. All of you may have heard about this uh, missile system. You know the, the the defense system of missile that Russia has provided. I think uh, Russia has provided Iran that is S300, which is a lower version, and uh, Turkey has got S400, which is of a higher version, and Russia has provided these two countries. So just to uh, keep these countries into perspective in terms of power, because we are talking about geopolitics, and uh, uh, just to keep them uh, in, in a particular frame. Now, uh, taking a cue from Sarkhan, uh, this historical uh, narration, I think it equally applies to Iran also, and. Uh, uh, it applies to uh, such an extent that they are so much shackled that they simply don't come out or come out of it. It's not just 1979 revolution, uh, uh, but even be before that, being ancient civilization, the Persian Empire, all those things. So uh, what uh, what what these countries, uh, Russia or Turkey or Iran, uh, they have imbibed uh, through these uh, experiences or the reading of their history is a particular set of strategic culture, what I call a strategic culture, which actually 
uh, uh, imparts these rulers a certain way of thinking which is slightly different in, in other aspects of life or, or uh, applicable to other countries. So as far as Iran is concerned, it also has uh, different phases uh, which has given it a shape that we see. And uh, uh, the one thing that we often read about Iran whenever we talk about geopolitics is its relationship with, with the United States. Uh, it is very strange that whenever we talk about, about Iran, we always uh, see most mention of, of United States. And I think this is the first thing we must uh, be clear of why exactly is that. Uh, it is not that we are going to be more interested in understanding United States or may be more attracted to that great country, which is actually a superpower. But actually, the, the, the entire domestic politics of Iran is hinging around, around that country. And those who have read the history of Iran, 1979 revolution, may have been very familiar about the hostage crisis that uh, had gone through. But why do I allude to that? is that uh, in the current era, that is uh, uh, long ago, uh, it was 79, it is more than, um, uh, more than 40 years uh, ago. And now when Qasim Soleimani was killed, again, uh, the history has gone to that epicenter, which is the, the, the embassy of United States. And they have now converted, which was a sort of museum, the United States embassy in, in, in Tehran, they have now converted into a, uh, into, into, uh, into a kind of, uh, a shrine. I mean, where they can, uh, do, it's, it's a kind of mosque they have created where Shia people can do and do mourning. Husanya, this is what they call. And uh, that is simply to take everything in the historical perspective and understand everything that is happening in the current era uh, under the lenses of past. So that is one issue that has been uh, touching Iran and that has shaped it in the form that we see it today. So uh, Iran is one country uh, which has the highest, highest, uh, uh, the, the topmost hydrocarbon equivalent. Uh, that is, if you combine uh, gas and oil, then it is the richest country in that perspective. And uh, when we talk about uh, understanding a particular country or a region, we, then we simply talk about uh, what are the benefits that we can get out of it or what are the threats that we can get out of it. But the benefit that could, the world could have got through Iran, that was hydrocarbon equivalent, that has been stopped through sanctions. So uh, Iran has been sidelined uh, from that perspective. Now, uh, in terms of threat, Iran has been defined as the greatest threat uh, in the region. And that has also given it a shape uh, through which most outsiders look at this country. So in a few minutes uh, time, I would like to draw attention uh, to the Iranian perspective, because uh, when we talk about Iran, uh, uh, we can see from outside how we can see, look at Iran, uh, the way United States says that uh, malign behavior or the rogue state or things like that. Uh, well enough, I don't dispute that. Uh, but in order to understand a country or the threat coming out of it or the opportunities coming out of it, uh, one must take into account its own perception, its own view, its own vision, its own imperative. And I think that is important for the scholars to, to understand. So uh, just a few minutes about how Iran sees uh, the world. Now, again, we have to go back to 1979 and the 10 years up to the death of the first supreme leader of uh, Iran, that was Khomeini. That was the first period uh, through which Islamic Republic or what we call Iran has got a particular shape. And during that time, uh, we used to hear that Iran has an expansionist agenda. Uh, it had actually enshrined in a literal sense the export of revolution. It was the first Islamic revolution that had come into place. And uh, the whole neighborhood was worried that uh, this, uh, this uh, revolution would be exported to the region. That was the first teasing aspect of Iran after the revolution. And that is why, that is what has actually created this conflict. Uh, this the this, this very notion of, of, of Islamic uh, state and its, rebel, its export. But uh, this kind of uh, mentality or this kind of approach short-lived for 10 years, it, it stayed there. After the death of Khomeini and during that period, we saw Iran-Iraq war for eight years which sort of crippled or, or, or broke Iran in, in many, many aspects. And it had to, it had to get away from that kind of ideology and it had to rebuild. 
uh, rebuild uh, its, its, own, its own country. So this is how Iran started and there were various leaders. The topmost was of course uh, Supreme Leader Khamenei who was on the apex and all of you know that uh, the, the hierarchy in, in Iran is, uh, is such that there are various power center with just one supreme leader who is the final arbiter of all the power centers, which we will not go into detail. But uh, from the death of Khomeini, that is the first supreme leader, until the next landmark that we see in the history of Iran and its relationship with the outside world is the 9-11 episode. Because it was a Sunni uh, dominated, you know, team that had uh, attacked the United States and its symbol of power. And uh, that was one scenario where Iran being a Shia country and uh, being sort of leader of the whole community was not seen in a way the uh, US now sees you know, Iran. So that was a very short, for a very short period of time, Iran had sort of cooperation with the United States, but then uh, George W. Bush came sort of, you know, uh, dictum and then that was very short lived. And then the third phase that we see is that of uh, 2014 with when uh, we saw the, the ISIS resurgence or Islamic State of uh, uh, Iraq and, and, and Syria and that happened, which was eventually a result of the Arab Spring. But uh, this particular phase is very important in the history of Iran and particularly the history of Iran's relationship with the outside world. Why is that so? Because uh, again, ISIS was a threat from Sunni Muslims and Iran being sort of leader of the, of the Shia, Shia community. So Iran was very easily and naturally perceived as a very natural threat to this ISIS. And if you remember that the Iran nuclear deal uh, was very much in the, in, the, in the talking just after that, after 2014, and it took one year, July 2015, Iranian nuclear deal happened. And Normally, normally we see that, okay, Iran's nuclear proliferation was one reason, its regional expansionism was one reason. Uh, but uh, why did, because other European powers and, and other countries are very interested, like China and Russia, very interested in having nuclear deal. But why did United States uh, 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 was uh, agreed? Why did United States agree uh, to this proposition? And I would uh, contend that it's not only Obama's, you know, Obama's uh, brainchild, uh, uh, but it was the, the product of the circumstances, the, 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 the history or the, if we go back into time at that time, now we don't see ISIS as big a threat as we see it now. So at that point of time, Iran played a very crucial role and that is how it fitted in the scheme of things. And that is my view, of course, one can contest, but this is how I look, how I look, uh, uh, how I look at it. So now after nuclear deal and then Donald Trump has come and all of us know that uh, uh, why he has a conflicting relationship with, uh, with, with, with Iran in a manner that we have it now because they do share a very conflicting relationship. So Iran's domestic politics, its revolution, its international relations, everything is intertwined with the United States. Now United States is an all pervasive power in the Middle East. And now this is the all pervasive power which is not liked by other great powers that is Russia and China. And if Russia and China want to have some sway in that region, then they can only have it through the players of that region, which doesn't have a good relationship with the United States. So that is how Iran becomes a very crucial instrument in the hands of uh, Russia and China. So this is about great powers, but here, of course, we will not talk about China, but yes, uh, Russia, we have to consider and Turkey, uh, Sarkhan has uh, very eloquently uh, you know, narrated how uh, it has uh, played a role here. Now, I would just say that uh, there are some, uh, you know, aspects of it which we must look into when we analyze this whole situation of uh, the, the sort of alliance or, you know, sort of cooperation between Iran, uh, Russia and Turkey. Now, again, going back to the narrative of the United States that we see is that uh, the uh, United States or the strategists sitting in that country call China and Russia as the revisionist power. So uh, revisionist power means that uh, these are the powers who are attempting to revise the entire game plan uh, in the Middle East, which is truly so. So uh, United States has to be, uh, 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 has to have some problem with 
with these countries. But uh, when these countries see Iran as an instrument uh, of, of, of this, this, this end, then uh, they actually uh, sort of align with this country. And not to be specific, this was a general, general thing. To be very specific, uh, how does Iran see the outside world? Just before, before 9-11 and even uh, after that, Saddam Hussein came. So when the Saddam Hussein was there, it had fought a war for eight years. And Saddam Hussein was perceived as a big threat to, to Iran. And Iran was sort of shackled. But then all of a sudden, Saddam Hussein uh, 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 was defeated and Iraq became kind of a country where Iran could again have some influence. So the Iran, which was feeling sort of shackled after that Iran-Iraq war, and uh, uh, then it was trying to recollect itself. Then this uh, the overthrow of Saddam Hussein 2003, it provided sort of uh, rejuvenated energy to the Iranians to uh, to uh, to assert uh, assert their uh, their influence in the region. That was one aspect of it. But there was another aspect also, and that was that now Iran could see that the American forces are closing in to their borders. Now, suppose uh, uh, United States sitting far away and uh, Pentagon is having uh, conceiving different kind of policies. That's all good. But when the actual boots on the ground, they are approaching the border of a country, then how would it behave? In Islam, there is a sort of, uh, 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 in, in Islam, uh, people know that, that there was a war, war of Khandak, war of trenches, which is very famous. It was fought by Prophet Muhammad. And uh, so Iran has this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of, uh, of course, Iran has not told me this, but one can look at it that the Shia crescent that we see is actually kind of trenches it has been building around it. And what are those trenches? The, the Syria is a trench. Uh, or uh, you know Afghanistan could be uh, called a trench, Iraq could be called a trench. So all around Iran, it has been building trench because it is in a war with an asymmetric power that is the United States. So how do you do? Prophet Muhammad has said that when, have, when you have to defeat an asymmetric power, a greater power than you, then you do this because they had fought a war and they had been victorious. So Ayatollah Khamenei has been doing this. He has been creating trenches, which is what we call Shia. Present and of course, opportunity is provided by what you see in Syria. You know the the Shia population, whatever it has, you know, and wherever it can influence, like in Lebanon, things like that. So it has been trying to what do you call the statecraft? State, you know, what the Americans say, malign behavior is for Iran, a statecraft. And when you're sitting, uh, uh, you sit sitting up uh, uh, in a, in a small a small place and creating trenches, and you cannot move out then. If you have several stones, then you can also throw out on the enemy. That is what the missile, that's the role that the missiles play, you know, because uh, the, the idea of trench is that uh, 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 defeat the enemy with, with, with the patience. You be patient, so the enemies would be defeated. But here they have improvised a certain way and they are now building missiles. So this is the idea of security for the Iranians, uh, building trenches, Shia Crescent, and then missile power until the time, until the time. And again, this is not the Iranians' official view, as the outside world knows, or they simply say that Iran is trying to have the nuclear capability uh, for good reason that we all of us know. So uh, this is the entire uh, perspective of Iran. But we don't read about this. We don't hear about this. And uh, uh, that is a sort of uh, an issue which actually creates trouble in, uh, in terms of understanding Iran. So, uh, so I think it was just uh, an attempt on my part to give this kind of understanding uh, to uh, what happens uh, with Iran and uh, its relationship with the other world. Now, uh, Russia and Turkey, of course, Russia and Iran uh, did not share a very good relationship. Uh, Russia, uh, Russia had a very bad relationship with, with Iran, but of course, uh, Russia has not seen Iran in a way the United States sees it as, as a threat. So, uh, so th that is actually somehow uh, which has provided, uh, you know, these two countries an opportunity. But uh, there are certain pointers which we, we must keep in, in our mind in terms of uh, Russia's uh, military cooperation with, with Iran. Um, one of the largest, you know, uh, military cooperation, uh, S-300, I have mentioned, and then Bushehr nuclear power plant, which was built by Russia, which is very important because nuclear issues are very much induced. Uh, so these are the reasons why Russia and Iran are close. Uh, so, but they, they, 
conflicting you know uh, relationship it is embedded with conflicts also and uh, uh, just uh, just one glimpse of it we saw when uh, uh, now when uh, iran was having a deep uh, conflict uh, sorry iran, russia was bombarding syria then it was using this hamadan hamadan air base of iran once it had uh, used and it was uh, for the first time after world war 2 that iran had provided a third country as a, another country its own air base i mean that was the height of their their cooperation iran and uh, and russia <clears throat> but the true nature of this cooperation uh, uh, can be seen uh, through what happened immediately after that iran then russia that you are unnecessarily you know glamorizing or taking credit of this and then we won't allow you anymore so it was a very short lived cooperation so these kind of you know ups and downs keep happening happening between uh, russia and and iran just uh, last uh, two minutes i would uh, mention that when we talk about iran's relationship with russia or turkey and particularly about about iran's relationship with russia we have a certain feeling that now iran and russia are allies no it is not like that because uh, again you look uh, from the perspective of russia it has been forging equally good equally good uh, uh, it has been attempting to forge equally good relationship with other arab countries which are in conflict with iran that is saudi arabia even uh, with, uh, with with israel it wouldn't have want to have that kind of a relationship you know conflicting relationship and uh, so uh, it, it is uh, and 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 uh, some of the uh, hints that we can see that uh, entirely iran and russia cannot go hand in hand just go back to 2010 when a very wide scale of sanctions were being imposed on uh, on iran it was you know, russia which had uh, which has sided with the united states china had sided with the united states they had voted against iran and this uh, there were four set of sanction Uh, imposed on iran and this was the highest level of sanction in 2010 iran and uh, china, uh, china and russia both of them were siding with united states so at that point of time whatever the geopolitics of that era was and how it benefited these two countries so this is how iran uh, russia and china acted so i just want to draw home a point here is that there are no permanent friends there are no permanent foes so uh, whenever we are uh, focusing on the geopolitics of a particular region uh, we must uh, study it during that particular era during that particular time so it is uh, it is time related you know only then uh, we can understand and give some kind of projection as to uh, what will happen in terms of iran's relationship with uh, uh, with russia or turkey or for that matter uh, china which is of course not the mandate of this lecture so uh, here i would end and thank you so much for listening i will be ready for questions thank you thank you very much asif that was very interesting i think for me the take away from that was that 1979 absolutely was a seminal year not just for iran but for much of the middle east because of the iranian revolution um and in those days there was a there was a desire and an agenda that i think over the last few decades has actually evolved what i see more with iran is that the reason why there's such an obsession with the us is a desire for respect you know a desire to be treated um in a way that acknowledges its great history as the persian empire um i guess one of the things in the q and a we'll talk about as well is about russia but when i look at these three great um empires when i look at russia you see what might have been and was never fulfilled but they're very effective trouble makers because they're very good at going in where there's a gap and making trouble when they need to i think for turkey um it is also as much about the the animosity that i think is historic between the what were the ottomans and the arab states that came under their empire and were always restive states because they were so far from the center of power in the ottoman empire When you look at Iran it's an ancient civilization um um and I really feel that a lot of of what they do uh, as dangerous as it is is a desire really to be taken credibly and to be taken seriously so a lot of what you talked about us it was actually very very interesting yeah I think we now open the floor for questions if you could raise your hand if you have a question to ask um identify yourself and can you turn on your camera so that whoever you are addressing the question to knows who that they are who they are talking to um 
we are meet you now. Uh, floor is open for questions. Surely Asif and Sir Khan have not answered everything that people wanted to, to ask. Um, if I could call one of my colleagues from the Institute, perhaps one of you could ask a question. Okay, Fontaine. You have the floor, Fontaine. And after that, we have another question. Hi, um, thanks Sarkhan and Asir for your, um, for your talks. Uh, I found your perspective very insightful and I would just like to ask you about um, the interest of both countries in relation to the Kurdistan area of Iraq because um, it seems that this is one of the areas where they do cooperate on and recently we've had uh, instances where uh, you've had um, sort of uh, military operations to address uh, Kurdish rebels as well. So I was wondering whether you could just share your perspectives on uh, this particular area of cooperation for the two countries. Thanks. Asif, you want to go? Uh, no, please go ahead. Uh, um, thanks for the question. The um, Turkey's relationship to the Iraq and northern Iraq in particular, uh, Kurdistan region of Iraq, has been um, partly a sort of a function of uh, Turkish state's relationship with uh, Kurds living in Turkey. So um, there was a time, for example, when uh, the possibility of um, a peace process between the PKK and the, Kurd and the, and the Turkish state uh, was uh, on the table. Um, much of the mediation was sought through uh, or was hoped to be uh, sought through um, the, the, the Kurds in Iraq. Um, that was that sort of, um, w with, with deteriorating relations between uh, the Kurds and the Turkish state uh, within Turkey, that episode uh, was over. And then later on, uh, when the relationship between the PKK and uh, the Kurdistani government in, in Iraq uh, sort of went a bit sour, then Turkey steps in and improves uh, its relations uh, with, with the Kurdistani region. And with, so when I look at the, the, the history of, of relations over the past two decades, I don't see a clear pattern. And it is always a function of the uh, the geopolitics of the moment, what is happening in Syria, whether Turkey is entering Syria, what is um, the relationship that, that the Iraqi Kurdistan wants to have with the Kurds in Syria, then uh, defines uh, the, the kind of relationship they will have with Turkey. What is happening between PKK and Turkey has an impact on, you know, what they think of the, uh, the, uh, the the, the aspirations for political uh, independence or more political autonomy within Iraq of, of the uh, Iraqi um, uh, Kurds, all that doesn't give me a very clear uh, <coughs> sort of picture for me to then forecast uh, into even near future. Thanks. Asit, did you want to uh, add to that? Uh, yes, a little bit, uh, uh, because uh, uh, when we talk about uh, this Kurdish issue, uh, uh, because the population is such that uh, it has uh, impact and of course it is populated in all these countries, uh, uh, Turkey, uh, Iran, Russia, uh, sorry, in, in, uh, Syria and Iraq. So all these countries have uh, this, this population of, 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 Kur of Kurds. So, uh, but I think uh, when Barzani uh, held that referendum and uh, despite, you know, <laughs> Uh, having so much of you and cry over the referendum, it died down. So the, the moment it died down, at, at the, until that time, you know, it was at the apex. And then the way Iraq had uh, 
you know, Iraq had reacted to that uh, Kurdish uh, referendum, uh, then I think this uh, issue uh, has died down. But uh, as far as Turkey is concerned, uh, especially because of the uh, the, the refugees or the migration that would happen, you know, from that area uh, into into uh, into uh, Kurdish uh, 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 Turkish region, and of course the secessionist uh, activities. That is why, of course, uh, Turkey was not. Uh, um, it was a very critical issue, so it was sort of uh, it's cooperation area of cooperation for these countries. Great. Okay, I have got five people in the queue. Some questions that I have to ask you, and two raised hands. The two people whose hands are raised, I will come back to you, but I got five people in the queue, so give me a minute. The first question is from Abdullah Albane. He's asked, do you see an upcoming conflict between these three ambitious powers, given the current dialogue they have and the interconnected conflicts they are participating in, such as Syria and Libya? Um, Michelle, can you repeat the very beginning of that question? Okay. Do you see an upcoming conflict between these three ambitious powers, given the current dialogue they have, um, and the interconnected conflicts they are participating in, such as Syria and Libya? Um, I'll, I'll start again. Um, I certainly don't see any upcoming conflicts. Uh, in the case of Iran and Turkey, that's, um, um, I, I don't see any ground for that. The possibility is really with between uh, Turkey and Russia, uh, given the fact that they are rivals now, basically in the proxy war in Libya, and also in the energy rivalry in Eastern Mediterranean, where Turkey is basically a lone, a lone wolf. Um, there is uh, growing an aggressive cooperation among Libya, uh, sorry, uh, Egypt, uh, Cyprus, Greece, uh, to a certain extent Israel, um, and Russia uh, is, is, is acting together with them, which uh, is really annoying Turkey, but Turkey um, is not targeting Russia in any uh, explicit way. And Russia is, I think, careful not to do the same. Uh, whether it is the Eastern Mediterranean or Libya. And the reason for this, I think, is that over the years, over especially since 2015, 2016, um, when there has been some sort of rapp rapprochement between Russia and Turkey, uh, which turned into a, a peace building process through the Astana uh, process, that these actors, uh, Russia and Turkey in particular, but also Iran, have learned how to work together uh, around issues that they have huge disagreements. Uh, this involves Syria, for example. Uh, they have managed, the leaders of these countries have managed to uh, prevent um, last minute, uh, big you know, humanitarian crises uh, in, in, uh, in, in Syria, um, but also in, in Libya as well. So they do as much as they can on the ground to come to the negotiation, a negotiation table as powerful as uh, they can be. But I think there is a clear understanding that they will never escalate whatever conflict they have uh, to the point of an actual hot conflict or war because they are too interdependent in my opinion. And uh, they share a certain fate in their sort of having a falling out with uh, the Western powers, especially the US. So all these three countries, um, they have uh, a lot at stake. Uh, so they, I don't think, uh, no matter what the disagreement is, that they will not uh, go into any hot conflict. Okay. Just before, Asif, before you talk, let me just say this. Uh, we've got questions after this from Dr. Alessandro Adino, who's our Principal Research Fellow, followed by Mr. Martin Marini. I've got two questions from Idris Durati and Nishal Chiu. Uh, we've got Dr. Julia Rognifa, who wants to ask a question. And James, I acknowledge that you have raised your hand. After Julia has spoken, I will call you. Thank you. Okay, Asif. Just... Uh, to what Sir Khan has already mentioned, just uh, one one point. Uh, uh, I mean, 
uh, it's not funny, but uh, of course, Donald Trump's uh, policies in the region, you know, uh, a lot of things are happening uh, because of his policies. So uh, when the, the administration, administration in the United States changes, then some dynamics might change. But of course, I agree with uh, Sir Khan that we don't see it in the future. So now the kind of alignment these countries are having and these military partnerships are, are real, you know, these are really real. So uh, I think uh, we, do, we see uh, alignment of interest among these countries. So. Great, thank you. Alex, you have the floor. And Martin, um, you can ask your question after Alex has spoken. Hi, Alex. Go ahead. We can't hear you. Alex, we can't hear you. Oops. Yep, we can't. Okay. Oops, he disappeared. Uh, Martin, would you like to ask your question while we wait for Alex to try and sort out his tech issues? Martin? Okay, let me ask a question now, then I'm going to move it on. We'll come back to the other two. There's a question from Idris Surati. I, I would like to ask both speakers to expand on the internal dynamics of the two societies which propel their outward mo movement. Shall I? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. Um, I think I did uh, some. Yeah. You did cover some of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, which is to say that uh, I think the key uh, propeller of Turkey's expansionism was, was the economic liberalization, as I argued. Uh, to say something more on that, um, up until that point, um, Turkey had the um, import subsidy industrializ industrialization model, so uh, there was really limited uh, economic um, ties between Turkey and the rest of the world. And politically speaking, basically Turkey was under the thumb of the United States. It was the Cold War era and the internal order, um, which was very fragile, was sustained through regular coup, military coups, basically. Every decade or so, uh, Turkey had uh, coup d'etats um, starting from 1960 which in a way made sure that, that Turkey's uh, internal politics are aligned with uh, the American interests and as a, as a country, sort of a frontier uh, of the Western world gazing across the communist frontier, um, it was essential that Turkey um, did not go either uh, in an Islamist direction or a leftist direction and, and what have you. So the liberalization of Turkish economy in the 80s, which allowed these um, Muslim communities in the periphery to really be emboldened and, and come into the political center with their own set of ideas about what, Turk, what role Turkey should have uh, in the world, really changed uh, Turkey, you know, in over the past uh, couple of decades, and with the collapse of the communist bloc, it basically that that internal transformation be, uh, uh, was married to um, globalization, uh, be it economic and cultural, uh, where these Turkish Muslims found a way of experimenting with their expansionist agendas in the safer um, environments like the Caucasus and Central Asia, which paralleled uh, an earlier Cold War moment um, where the US-Saudi uh, sort of collaboration in Afghanistan created a, a similar projection from the Arabian Peninsula into Afghanistan against the communist bloc. So this Turkish uh, flexing the Turkish Muslim communities, flexing their muscles in the Caucasus and Central Asia was a perfect uh, buffer for, uh, for the U uh, US administration in, um, between the, the communists in Moscow who were interested in reclaiming their former uh, Soviet space and 
the Islamists in Iran who were emboldened at the time uh, to, you know, ex if not export their revolution, to certainly build influence uh, in these regions. Asif? Uh, uh, Sorry, yes. can I just let Asif, does he want to say something? Yeah, uh, just a just couple of things I wish to add uh, to this, uh, uh, because we are talking about uh, common people. Uh, of course, it's very, uh, very, uh, very natural to think that a common person would, first of all, uh, like to think about bread and butter. Uh, whether the roof is on his head or not, whether he can move or to a neighbor and go and meet. I mean, these kind of things for common people, that's what is important. The strategic culture, these are things, uh, a prized position of, uh, in the domain of the leadership. Uh, but of course, it's these common people who go and transcend themselves to uh, achieve that position where they become leader. That is why these are important. But if you talk about now, what is the uh, the preference of a common uh, person, of course, economics is is is, is the uh, is the preference. So one can understand uh, what would be the discourse in the domestic uh, realm of of Iran. Uh, now, uh, but there is of course uh, a history and ideology uh, which uh, which which is very supportive of its outreach in the in the region. Uh, uh, the the Shiism that uh, Iran has, and uh, of course the twelver uh, Shiism that Iran has uh, the concept of Imam Mehdi, the concept of Vilayat al faqih or the leadership of not only Shia, uh, Shia residing within Iran, but also residing outside the territory. That's very important. And that's why it has so much of an influence on, uh, uh, you know, Shia people in Lebanon and things like that. So that is one thing which actually connects. But these are two different things, uh, how, how the power to be, uh, I mean, that they, they use these. Thank you. Okay. There's a question from Nashal Teo. With Turkey caught up in the recent Mediterranean energy crisis against Greece and Egypt, to what extent can the Turks still keep up with its pressure on the Kurds in northern Syria? And how will this affect their position or stake in Syria? I think this question is for you, Safan. Uh, yes. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, it's hard to answer because I think uh, at the moment, um, country, a country like Turkey has um, been involved in a lot of conflicts. So it has um, various stakes and interests that at one point may come into conflict with the interests of Russia, say in Libya, but converge in, in another place. So all these are, um, all these are, all these sort of, um, uh, stakes become also uh, negotiate, you know, uh, sort of, in a way, chips uh, in, 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 in Turkey's negotiation with many countries. So uh, Turkey has been very uh, defiant in Eastern Mediterranean, although it has been sort of left alone um, by the agreements between uh, Greece and uh, Egypt and also Israel and uh, Cyprus. Uh, it has been active in, in creating, charting its own uh, sort of uh, territory, so to speak, uh, with, with the agreement uh, with Libya. Um, and any points that they may win there uh, can, you know, strengthen their position uh, against, say, Russia in Syria. And it is all, so Turkey's position on Kurds, I don't think will change in any time soon. Of what Turkey can do, or what can Turkey, whether can whether Turkey can convince Russia to uh, to apply pressure maybe against the Kurds through the Assad regime, uh, is partly depends on what these two countries uh, will be able to uh, what what these countries will. Uh, will gain on the ground in Libya, say, or Eastern Mediterranean, etc. So, in a way, there's a very broad. Um, uh, it's a chess game, but it is it is stretched across a very large geography. So, uh, none of these individual conflicts, whether it's Yemen between Iran and Saudi Arabia or Libya between among many actors, are just standalone conflicts that will be decided just on their own. I think that e the fate of each conflict is increasingly dependent on uh, one another through these major uh, actors. Uh, and the most important of them, I think, are UAE, uh, Turkey, and Russia at the moment. 
Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from uh, Julia Rotnifa. Julia, I'm going to give you the floor. Now, we, so can we know her because Julia has participated in MEI in DEMS before, has very interesting perspectives. So Julia, we'll give you the floor now. Hello. Uh, it's How are you, Julia? It's good Not to see you. Not only lovely, but to remember me. <laughs> That's very pleasant. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, I said just for a change, I will appear uh, on the camera and ask you. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I guess my question is to uh, both of the panelists. Um, I very much liked how Sarkhan emphasized on that the marriage between Islam and politics uh, in Turkish politics is not um, is far much deeper um, than just superficial. And I think um, uh, the same could be said about Pakistani politics, uh, although in a bit of different fashion. Uh, and I'm sure the other speaker would agree with me. Uh, so I wanted to use it as a starting point for my question and uh, ask what's your opinion about the perspectives of uh, this nascent or proposed alliance, uh, which was um, uh, breeding, the idea of which was breeding before and during the KL summit last December, which one of you I think mentioned in your speech, uh, where uh, some of the Gulf leaders who were purposely excluded from even being invited to it. So um, given the cohesion between that seemingly um, appeared between Mahathir, Erdogan, uh, and Imran Khan, um, and also the Russians in some way, because uh, some of you might not know, but Russians also sent invoice for the KL summit and they were watching very closely. And well, in fact, I've been there. And um, so I wanted to ask, do you think the idea of creating a sort of an alternative to the OIC, to a, quite a defunct OIC, is it viable or, or are they going to bump into obstacles such as a lack of, of uh, financial resources when they will be unable to compete with uh, the Gulf countries or maybe you can think of some other obstacles. So how viable this idea looks from your point of view from, um, I don't know, how would it look from Turkey? Uh, how would it look from Pakistan. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Julia. After Julia, James, I will call you once uh, Sir Khan has answered this question. And then uh, Martin, who has sorted out his technical problems. And then Idris, um, you, can, you can ask your question after that, okay? We'll put you back in the queue. Uh, so, Sir Khan. Uh, thank you, Julia. Uh, very interesting question. Uh, I think Turkey is very serious, seriously invested. In, in this alliance. I had my uh, own hesitation as to how much I sh this, this uh, alliance, if you can call it that way, or an axis uh, should be taken, uh, how seriously it should uh, be taken. Um, but there has been interesting uh, developments, which now makes me a little um, more curious about this because First of all, the, uh, I think one of the moments when it, it crystallized was KL Summit, as you, as you mentioned. Another moment was when uh, Mahathir, uh, Imran Khan, and, and Erdogan uh, announced uh, that they would uh, finance a new sort of international English language Muslim channel uh, to correct you know, misconceptions about Muslims globally. Uh, and then uh, later on, more recently, Imran Khan has been um, quite defiant vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Saudis, uh, basically uh, calling them out on their silence on the Kashmir issue, uh, an issue which Turkey uh, basically invests in or, or uses as, uh, as a way to show Pakistan uh, that, that, that Turkey would be on its side when it comes to uh, any possible um, conflict in Kashmir between India and Pakistan. In the meantime, India is, you know, on the other side, uh, really closing up to the UAE. Uh, so, so if so, there is this this northern axis uh, of non-Arab uh, countries, save Qatar, uh, reaching all the way to Malaysia and benefiting to a certain extent. Uh, a Russian umbrella or, or, or a tacit support from Russia, a selective support from Russia, because Russia would not be, wouldn't necessarily be in, in, invested in this axis. 
content-wise, ideologically, because this is a very sort of Muslim, um, it is, it's an axis of political Islam, if we call it uh, anything. Um, but I think all these countries uh, would benefit greatly uh, from Russia in terms of political patronage. Uh, but in terms of even financial resources, having Qatar on their side uh, changes the picture a little bit. Um, if it wasn't for Qatar, I think if it weren't for Qatar, I think it would have been uh, very difficult for uh, these countries, which are not necessarily, I mean, um, Malaysia and Turkey are uh, maybe quite strong. Uh, you could say mid-sized powers, but they, they couldn't even really shoulder the burden of, of uh, sustaining such an alliance. Uh, so they need, they need others. And I think um, Russia, uh, to a certain extent, China, who knows, uh, are, are potential uh, sort of backers of, 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 of this axis. Um, I think it, it is here to stay for a while. Uh, I, I have my doubts as to the uh, efficiency of, uh, of such an axis in, in bringing about in any, any geopolitical change, but uh, it is worth watching. Thank you. Thank you. James, you have the floor. Hi. Um, I have a couple of comments for Serkan and for Asif, which I would like them to respond to. Uh, Serkan, I realize you, you mentioned the Soviet, rise of the Soviet Union, but didn't get around to speaking to about, about it. But it strikes me that that was important on three levels. It was Turkey's chance to uh, develop a Turkic world and a, and a major area of influence. What were cold, cold borders during the Cold War suddenly became open and warm borders and Turkish identity changed. For the first time you saw the, all of this explosion of cultural association, Chechens and Circassians and, and, and Tatars and whatever ever else. And there was a lot of engagement on that ethnic basis, not necessarily on a religious basis. Second of all, when you look at the economic expansion into the Caucasus and Central Asia immediately after the demise of the Soviet Union, it was first and foremost the secular Istanbul majors, Alarko, the Sabanches, the Koch, Exagibash. Uh, the religious players came in one later and on a much smaller scale. They, they did not have the big ticket infrastructure contracts that the Turks were pushing with the secular uh, forces. And the third point, very briefly, when you talk about the religious networks, we're talking about multiple networks. And the one you, you didn't mention, which is I think is extremely important, is the Gulen network. Uh, Asif, uh, I think that you know, we all look at Iran and we look at an Islamic revolution. We look at uh, a revolutionary regime, but in many ways, this was also a nationalist revolution. And if that were, wasn't clear in the first year, it sec certainly became clear in the second year of the revolution with the Iran-Iraq war. And so what I think you're seeing, and if you look at it from the Iranian perspective, what the Iranians are seeing is one, a, uh, a countering of the revolution from day one with the Gulf support for the Iran-Iraq war, the Saudi funding campaign, look at Pakistan on, on Iran's border, uh, the progression uh, or multiplication of the US military presence in the region. And so what you end up with is mirror images of one another, sure, fueled by things like the US embassy occupation, but you end up with the Iranians essentially seeing them so surrounded by, uh, by hostile forces, both the United States and the Gulf. And that's what, it, as a matter of principle, what this is really about. Okay, great. Thanks, James. Um, let me just take a question from Martin Marini because he had a technical problem and has been patiently waiting in the queue. So Martin, would you like to ask your question? And then Sir Khan and Asif um, can respond to James and also answer your question. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thanks, Michelle. My question is, uh, um, if, if um, the pundits are right and Trump wins re-election in November, and God forbid this will ever happen, but if Trump wins in November, uh, could this result in some closer cooperation between countries like, for example, Erdogan's Turkey, Iran, Syria even, um, as now these countries would 
and perhaps even Russia, if you throw into the pot. Uh, because now all these countries will have a common, if you like, enemy in a Trump, administered, uh, Trump administration. So what does um, Asif and, and Sir Khan think about this? Thank you. So um, you have uh, responses to James and then Martin's question. Uh, how do you want to do this? Would you like to answer Martin's question first and then you can respond to James because it's a bit of a two-parter with James, I think, because he's covered both of what you've talked about. Sure. Yeah? Um, so we'll answer Martin first. Thank you, Martin. Uh, if Trump wins re-election, that's good news for Erdogan uh, and, and Turkey. And I think relations between the US and Turkey uh, hasn't been as bad as it could have been, uh, thanks to a very strong relation between Turkey and Erdogan, uh, between, uh, between Trump and Erdogan. And, and um, if Trump wins re-election, uh, which I see very unlikely, but if that happens, uh, I think that will uh, definitely uh, give Erdogan a, a, a huge outlet in, in the Western world. Um, will not necessarily change uh, Turkey's direction uh, in the sense that it will continue to cooperate with Russia, with, with Iran, um, even maybe more so with China. Um, but I think it will be, uh, it will give it, give it some breathing space vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Western world. Uh, I don't think uh, Trump's re-election would push Turkey uh, away from the U.S. because these are two uh, very pragmatic uh, strongmen uh, leaders uh, and they uh, have a way of fixing uh, crisis-like situations between uh, Turkey and the U.S. Uh, even over a single phone conversation. So that's uh, my answer uh, to, to Martin. Should I continue with my Sorry, Michelle, I didn't hear you. Yeah, why not? Um, now, I think Sakan and Asif, you probably want to respond to James because he had some interesting perspective as well. Um, and then I think once we clear that, and then um, Idris, if you're still online, uh, I will call you, but let them both answer or respond to James first, okay? Uh, uh, James, ahead. thanks as well. Uh, you're right, uh, that was... Uh, Turkey's chance to create a Turkic world, if you really uh, believe that that was uh, at all possible. Uh, and in just a few years, if not months, that Turks who went to the Caucasus in Central Asia uh, realized that uh, such a dream was, was, was impossible. Uh, but you're right that it was first and foremost an ethnic and linguistic, uh, it was first and foremost ethnic and linguistic ties that really uh, became the basis of, of, of uh, cooperation uh, between Turkey and, and the states in Central Asia and the Caucasus. I don't necessarily agree with you when you say that the Muslims were very late and it was the secular big, biz, you know, uh, big businesses uh, in, in Istanbul that got the big tickets. They got the big tickets, but uh, it, the Muslims were there from day one, even uh, from uh, before the collapse of the Soviet Union, they infiltrated, uh, I mean, I'm talking sort of months in advance, and among them was, was the Gulen network. Um, and their sort of ground, sort of bottom up, grounded work in these countries uh, created a much longer or long lasting legacies uh, in terms of Turkish influence there compared to big infrastructure um, projects that, that the big businesses from Istanbul uh, got in the early uh, years. But there, even in those years, there have this sort of dichotomy was, sort of was beginning to break down as well, that there was uh, some cooperation uh, between sort of the secular, secular big business and, and, and the Muslim uh, networks. Uh, so Asif. Yeah, I would like to uh, add something to uh, to Martin's uh, comment uh, because uh, see uh, Supreme Leader Atullah Khamenei is in power for about 30 years, 30 long years 
and it was four year was a very short time for Donald Trump to understand his tactics. So maybe uh, even Barack Obama also did a nuclear deal in the second term at the back end of the second term. So uh, maybe uh, Donald Trump may have understood in the second term a little better about Iran and uh, Supreme Leader because uh, he is really not understanding of uh, why they are doing so much of sacrifice or not coming on the table to negotiate. On, on James's uh, comment, of course, I couldn't agree more. Uh, nationalism, uh, uh, in past we know that uh, the Islam came in, in Iran and they still retained their Persian language. Uh, the Nowruz is, in fact, much more celebrated than any other Islamic festival. And uh, uh, in the current era, uh, 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 you know, even the Iranian diaspora that is there, many countries, if their own countrymen go outside and if they are in a better place country, better condition, they forget their own country of origin. Iranians never forget. Uh, they go to the United States, they are living so nicely, decently, but they are so worried about what is happening back in Iran. And of course, uh, even if they don't like regime, they would like to, uh, you know, do the regime, I mean, transformation, the society and quality. So nationalism is, of course, of course, uh, very much uh, prominent and dominant, and it, it percolates in every aspect of, of society and quality. Thank you. Great. Um, Idris, are you still on the on the online would you like to would you like to ask any questions of uh, us for uh, Safan? yes uh, you know uh, I, i'd like to expand on my earlier questions about internal dynamics but i think that is very interesting uh, because uh, change uh, uh, permanent change normally happens within the internal dynamics of course external geopolitics has got influence on that but internal dynamics uh, becomes uh, very important uh, james has asked a question about gulen um, I want to pursue that. Uh, yes, you, you rightly said the influence of Gulen is more subtle and more long-lasting as compared to uh, the, the current way of I mean, projecting Islam. Uh, the, the establishment of schools in, in this part of the world, especially in Indonesia, and the charter school in, in United States has got, and also in Africa. Uh, our contact with the with the initial opening of Turkey was through the Gulen uh, here in Singapore, uh, through the cultural center. I think that. Um, over time, uh, is it possible that uh, the the Kraton, uh, projection of Islam will alienate the secular group, and then that uh, may bring about a more uh, a greater alliance between the secular and and, and the Gulen type, which are uh, a more subtle, uh, sophistic uh, thing like that. That is um, the, the question. Uh, the other thing about Iran, uh, my contact with the students in Iran, uh, many of them are very. Uh, uh, skeptical, uh, very critical of the, of the mullahs. And the reason why they're able to, uh, to sustain uh, their hold on power is got to do with the also part of the reason because of uh, uh, the sanction. The sanction uh, strengthened their power. And at the same time, they have access to, they have control of the economy. And those who have access, uh, the clergy are very much involved uh, in, in business. And, uh, and those who have access to the military also have access uh, to the business. While the technocrats who are actually running the bureaucracy are being slowly being alienated uh, in the sense that their, their income is affected and then their purchasing power is affected. Do you think there'll be uh, uh, the future dynamics uh, will be a conflict between uh, the, the technocrats uh, and, 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 the, uh, and, and, and the, the collusion between the military and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, the clergy? Uh, to see whether the dynamics within will help to change uh, uh, the way they project the uh, uh, the countries uh, outward. Yeah, there is a comment on this. Yes. Sakan, James, uh, Asif. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, now I understand the question much better. Um, I think uh, first of all, the any comeback of Gulen movement in Turkey, whether it's through an alliance with seculars or any other way, is practically impossible. A reputation tanked. And they, any insinuation that you have a connection or sympathy toward the Gulen movement, left, right, uh, Islam, secular, um, it's, it's a no-no. And this, I don't think this will change. There is a broad national consensus on um, what was wrong about the Gulen community, even if some people have uh, reservations about, not reservations, but some people acknowledge uh, what sort of good things that they have done uh, maybe elsewhere 
uh, abroad, you know, um, for the Turkish state. So that's a no-no. But uh, there's an interesting development. There is a uh, there is a growing disillusionment with political Islam in Turkey. That's a fact. Uh, in the beginning of uh, 2000s, when Erdogan was on the rise as a sort of a democratic uh, reformer figure, uh, liberals were sort of rejoiced in, you know, in the possibility of this sort of Muslim figure, uh, you know, democratiz democratizing uh, the country, but also changing the Muslim majority and integrating them to the rest of the world, etc. Erdogan, I don't think single-handedly did that, but against his majority of uh, Muslim Turks have greatly integrated themselves to the rest of the world, which means that the more uh, political Islam symbols and discourses and narratives that are not employed, uh, the, the, the new generation, the sort of the children of these uh, Anatolian tigers, basically were, were, were uh, done with it. And you, in big uh, surveys in Turkey, you have growing uh, disillusionment not only of, uh, from political Islam, but also growing uh, uh, sort of atheism, even in uh, sort of religious uh, schools, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that is a big sort of undercurrent. Um, but uh, on the other hand, seculars have changed in Turkey. Although they would go against any, you know, uh, politically speaking, and, or political Islam, you know, in, the, in Islam in the, in the political field, they would not mind seeing headscarf people in the public, which was a huge no-no in the 1990s. So actually, Turkish society has, in this sort of underneath all this fight between the seculars and the Islamists and so on, Turkish society have become actually very much uh, homogenized or having some sort of consensus as to have a certain balance not to go extreme in the political Islam and not to go extreme in uh, stone secularism in the public space. So that's the only good news uh, uh, from Turkey. Asim? Uh, yes, uh, uh, to, to Idris Thanks, Khan. Thanks, uh, To Idris Khan, a very, very pertinent question. And uh, now, uh, in order to answer this question, I'll go back to where I had started. Uh, whether you want to be friend to a country or whether you want to uh, have an enmity, you must understand that country. Uh, the narratives that uh, you know United States and its allies have been creating, they are themselves trapped in that. Uh, uh, just one instance I'll give you, uh, like uh, uh, some democracy could be considered as no democracy, you know? And uh, the, the internally, uh, what happened during the era of Muhammad Mossadegh, uh, the people all across Iran, they understand that. So when the United States would talk about democracy, uh, you know, the people understand. Now, the culture of Iranians, they have brought a revolution. So one cannot doubt that they have this potential to bring a revolution. It was not long, long time ago, just 40 years ago. So that element is there. But what would be the reason for that revolution? You know, we don't see that reason in a way that could actually, you know, propel them. Now, off and on, it's been coming. When, when, when Donald Trump says something, how many people in Iran read that? You know, it would be the elite. And that is what normally we see, unless and until there's a gas price rise and, uh, you know, the price of egg rises, or the price of vegetables rises, these kind of things, you know, actually aggregates and kind of, uh, that kind of thing. But uh, some kind of enforced, enforced revolution, that is not. And that is, for that, I think there's just one cue, I think it's very important to understand the electoral process within Iran only the best of minds all across the world understand that, uh, that the presidential election within Iran uh, is not entirely democratic. <laughs> you know, the people on the street, they do not understand that, that it's not entirely democratic. So this ventilation that Iran has in terms of elect electoral process, it is for others to understand what is guardian council, what is council of experts, what is supreme leader. So I think there you are. I think one can find out answer to these questions there. Thank you. Thanks, Asif. Okay, I have one last question, and I'm going to give it to our colleague, Amin. Uh, Amin, you can ask your question of both our colleagues. <laughs> can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, you might have to speak a little bit louder. Okay, is, is it better now? E, sort of. Okay, my apologies. I'm not sure. I think my mic is not really. 
properly. No problem. Um, but but I, I'll just ask, I'll, I'll try to be loud. My question is, it's a short question, and I'm, I'm, I want to ask both panelists, if you think that this emerging uh, alliance between um, between Turkey, Malaysia, Iran, Qatar, and Pakistan, is it only a short-term thing that comes into being a, in opposition to Saudi Arabia and uh, sort of short-term geopolitical growth? Or is there something in common, be it social, ideological, or religious, that can keep them together in the long run for them? Okay, who wants to tackle it first? I give the floor to Asif first. <laughs> uh, I, I, was, I, I had this inkling to say that Amin himself can answer this question much better than anybody else. Uh, because those of us who know him in MEI, he's our clique, uh, he has much better expertise on this. So, <laughs> but since he has asked this, I don't see it going very long. I, this is my opinion because Amin knows it better. I don't see it going, uh, going, going far, you know. It has some domestic political orientation also, this is that thing. I think that, that, that much I can say. Thank you. Saka? That really didn't give me much time to think about it, but... <laughs> I mean, he's put you on the spot, hasn't he? <laughs> I think there's something structurally similar between these countries, and that's what I'm interested in, which is, you know, when you compare uh, countries like uh, Turkey, Iran, uh, with, say, UAE and Saudi Arabia, is that um, Turkey, Iran are big countries, yes, with imperial histories and so on, but also with uh, huge constituencies. Uh, there is a process uh, with all its, you know, uh, faults, there's still a, a minimal democratic process uh, still in place. And this applies to Pakistan, this applies to Malaysia. Uh, so the, when, when I look at these countries, uh, they, they look very similar to me in terms of uh, having a very dynamic internal domestic political and social space in which uh, their leaders have to still uh, somehow be in honest communication with, the con with their constituencies. They have to mobilize, uh, if not uh, more than half of uh, the country, certainly maybe 30, 40% at least. Uh, and that is why I think the kinds of discourses we see or sentiments, the historical narratives, symbols, etc., are here to stay as long as these countries have these systems in place, as long as these countries have huge uh, populations. I think the, the odd ones out, uh, if, if we take these two geopolitical alignments seriously, is Egypt. Egypt would naturally be on this side it's structurally speaking. It's a big country with a huge population, etc. cetera. But um, it, it has to sustain power now over a huge majority that is resentful. That's not easy. Mm -hmm. And it relies on, at least financially, uh, on, on its partners to, to its south and, and east, mm -hmm. uh, to a certain extent, Israel, etc. And the odd one out in the northern one is Qatar. Qatar is very much like Saudi Arabia and, and, and uh, UAE, um, but it somehow ideologically and politically it has found itself on the other side and it brings something so valuable to the other side, which is money, which, which they don't have. In the, in the Arab, uh, on the Arab side, Egypt brings something so valuable to the table, which is potentially troops, you know, millions of people uh, uh, to be mobilized, uh, which the Arab states otherwise don't have. Mm. So in that way, it is interesting. And as long as there is some friction between these two alignments, uh, I think it will give enough fuel for, for this, axis or alliance extending from Turkey all the way to Malaysia. But you can see how the, how the shifting interests then lead to shifting sort of partnerships, you know? Uh, so what is not immediately apparent, um, you know, there, there are more practical, it's a, there's a pragmatic reason for why the 
partnerships occur as they do, when, when you look at it, you wouldn't think that they, that would exist naturally, you know. So at the end of the day, there's also that pragmatism, which I think is a reality. Okay, we have run well over time. I have to thank you both for your time. I think it's been a very interesting session, and I thank everyone who has stayed the course with us until 6.40 in the evening. Um, um, we hope to see all uh, of you next week. Uh, I don't know, we're ending already, Chen Wei, Chen Wu. So, um, no, it's high. I think that uh, at the end of the day, um, we, we will, it was, a, um, you know, you, you can't look at what goes on in the, in the, in the Middle East without looking at these players. Uh, next week, we will take a look at the role of China because, again, it's another big player that you cannot ignore. And the week after, we'll look at the United States. Um, you know, because essentially, if you want to look at geopolitical competition in the Middle East, it is a, it, there, there are many players who have many interests, and they're not all new to the game. Some have been there for a long time, and they are driven by different agendas and different interests. Right. So we thank you both very much for your time. Thank you. Sir so um, please don't stay, don't, don't uh, cut off contact with the Middle East Institute. You know, we, we would love to have you join us on Zoom meetings. Um, and continue to be involved in the discussions. And we thank you all very much for your time. Uh, and we'll see everyone next week. Thank you very much. And you have a safe flight tomorrow, Sakan. Thank you. Okay, goodbye, everyone. Thank you.